In this first part of the lecture on respiration, we're going to talk in general about what respiration is, what its function is, and we'll talk about different categories of respiration, how we categorize the use of ATP from respiration for different tree processes. So let's, let's start with the definition. Respiration is just the oxidation of carbohydrates to produce um, ATP for use in other processes. Um, also produces intermediate compounds. Often those are called carbon skeletons. So not only does respiration produce ATP energy that can be used for energy requiring reaction, it also produces carbon skeletons, compounds that are used as building blocks for other chemical constituents. This is the general empirical formula for respiration. A couple of things to note. First, glucose is the primary reactant. So remember glucose produced by photosynthesis. Um, in the presence of oxygen, it's oxidized to produce carbon dioxide, water, and ATP. And of course, this is the really important step. That ATP can then be used um, to power energy requiring chemical reactions. Just like photosynthesis, when we showed the empirical formula for photosynthesis, the empirical formula for respiration is just the summary formula. It's actually a also a linked series of biochemical reactions, but we'll just talk about that empirical form formula. Thinking about that reaction, what happens if we turn the arrow around and face the other direction? What is that? That's photosynthesis, right? CO2 and water yields glucose and oxygen. So you can almost think about respiration as the process that reverses the process of photosynthesis. Essentially what it does is it respiration releases the chemical bonds contained in glucose that was captured there um, by photosynthesis and releases them in the form of ATP for use by the tree. Let's think about this as well. So this is essentially the same as the empirical formula for respiration, glucose in the presence of oxygen release CO2 and water, but instead of ATP, heat is released. What is this? What's this the empirical formula for? It's the empirical formula for fire. So another way that I sometimes think about respiration is that it's a controlled process of combustion. The energy that was stored in the chemical bonds of glucose or in cellulose is being released um, in a controlled way to produce ATP for use by the plant. Fire is just releasing that energy that was captured in photosynthesis and stored in the chemical bonds of glucose, but it's releasing it as heat rather than as ATP. Uh, so this is another way of putting it in equation form. So here's our equation for photosynthesis. Okay, right here. This is the empirical equation for photosynthesis. This is the empirical equation for respiration. 
So photosynthesis takes the energy from light and stores it in the chemical bonds of glucose. And then respiration takes that energy stored in the chemical bonds of glucose and releases it in the form of ATP. Respiration occurs in organelles called mitochondria. Mitochondria in singular, mitochondria plural. This is a cute little cartoon sort of contrasting the organelles of chloroplasts and mitochondrion. Uh, chloroplast obviously is the organelle in which photosynthesis occurs. Mitochondria are the organelles that, uh, in which respiration occurs. Now, obviously, not all organisms have chloroplasts, but many, actually most organisms, certainly most eukaryotes, have mitochondria. You and I have mitochondria. So our mitochondria met metabolize the cereal that we have for breakfast, breaks the glucose down, that was in the um, frosted flakes, and releases it in in the form of ATP for us to use. So mitochondria are a um, uh, organelle that occurs in many kinds of organisms. So you can really think of respiration as being a highly conserved process that occurs in many, many organisms. Finally, I, I just want to talk about terms a little bit because you'll see respiration referred to in a number of different ways. So you might see respiration just called respiration. Okay. Sometimes you'll see it called aerobic respiration. So note that in that empirical formula, the reaction, respiration reaction requires oxygen. So this process occurs in the presence of oxygen and and is called aerobic respiration. It occurs in mitochondria, so sometimes you'll see it called mitochondrial respiration. And then sometimes within the context of photosynthesis, you'll see this referred to as dark respiration because when, when people were first studying this process, it was uh, associated with the emission of CO2 from leaves in the dark. So sometimes it's called dark respiration. Confusingly, uh, the term photorespiration was coined because it was associated with the release of CO2 from leaves. But as we've learned when we talked about photosynthesis, this is not an equivalent process. So really photorespiration is an unfortunate term that refers to a different process than the processes we're talking about here. All of these processes here refer to the same process. And then sometimes people will, will hear the term transpiration and get confused, but that is also a different process. That refers to the evaporation of water from stomata, not an equivalent process. But all these first four terms mean the same thing. So just sort of to make sure we're talking about the same process, I sometimes like to lay it out to make sure we're clear what we're talking about. All right, mitochondria produce ATP through the process of respiration, and that ATP is used for different energy requiring processes in the tree. That ATP is the same regardless of how it's used. But scientists, for the purposes of analysis, often categorize the use of that ATP into two or sometimes three categories. Three most common categories are maintenance, transport, and growth respiration. And I just want to emphasize that these categorizations are artificial. It's the same ATP, but we categorize them so that we can uh, better analyze the use of this energy in the plant. So I'll talk about some examples of the, of the analysis that may be useful, but uh, just want to emphasize that this is somewhat artificial. But maintenance respiration briefly is just ATP used to maintain 
existing cells or existing tissue. So when the ATP is used that way, it's maintenance respiration. Transport respiration is ATP used to transport substances. Very often, um, transport of those substances across a membrane. And then growth is just ATP used to produce new cells or tissues. And those are pretty self-explanatory. So maintenance respiration As we already said, maintenance respiration is just ATP produced by respiration that's used to maintain existing tissues. That energy is used for a few different things. One is resynthesis of metabolic compounds. So if we think about a living cell, there are compounds in that cell that basically wear out and have to be replaced. This is mainly, mainly refers to proteins. And that's because proteins wear out really easily. They have a relatively rapid turnover. So this table shows, uh, and these are mainly enzymes. Those are all proteins. So these are different types of enzymes or proteins and their turnover rates. So in other words, how many days does it take for some of these to turn over? And you can see some of these turn over multiple times per day. And what that means is that, for instance, invertase in sugar beets tur turns over a couple of times a day. In other words, that protein wears out and has to be replaced that requires energy. So the repair or resynthesis of those proteins requires energy. Also the maintenance of ion and metabolite gradients across cell membranes requires energy. It's almost the definition of life is the maintenance of ion gradients within cells versus that outside the cell. And that maintenance of those gradients requires energy. And then finally, resynthesis of lipids or lipid compounds. This really is repair and maintenance of cell membranes mainly is what this is talking about. So all of those things are examples of energy requiring processes required to keep a cell alive. This first one is probably the biggest one. Protein turnover is really large, but all of these are costs associated with maintaining living cells. Transport respiration is the second category of use of ATP from respiration. And that ref is mainly associated with act active uptake through cell membranes and loading and unloading of the phloem. So active uptake, that's what this diagram shows through cell membranes. This is a diagram showing a cell membrane here. So the cytosol is the cytoplasm side, and it generally has a general negative charge inside the cell, and outside the cell has a generally positive charge. What that means is that positively charged ions, cations, can 
move passively through the cell membrane because of that charge difference. So this positively charged cation can move across the cell membrane, in this case through a cation channel, that's a protein that allows those cations to pass. That doesn't require energy because it's moving essentially down a concentration gradient. Simil similarly, negatively charged anions can move through an anion channel passively towards the outside. So those, the transport of cations into the cell or anions out of the cell happens through those membranes. Now those membranes do have are channels that, with gates that can be opened or closed, but in general, the transport itself is passive. Now, the movement, so the movement of anions in, so this, uh, this is negatively charged anions, requires energy. So that's indicated here. So the use of ATP is required for the transport transport of anions in so something like uh, NO3 which is a negatively charged anion that requires energy or ATP to transport across the cell membrane so that's an example of transport respiration or the use of ATP uh, to for the uptake of negatively charged ions across the cell membrane. So that requires energy. This can happen uh, in the roots. Uh, so the uptake of anions from soil into root cells requires energy, but this also happens, for instance, when anions are taken up out of the xylem into, for instance, cells in the leaf. Okay, so that's an example of transport respiration. The other main uh, example of use of energy is carbohydrate loading and unloading to or from the phloem. And we already talked about that in the previous lecture. Uh, we talked about phloem loading and unloading. Loading is almost always active, meaning it requires energy. That's transport respiration when that ATP is used for that. And then sometimes unloading can be active as well. So that's another example of transport respiration. And then growth respiration is the third category. That just refers to the use of ATP to produce new tissue. These are tables that were put together really painstakingly by Chung and Barnes, and they show the chemical composition of needles, axes, which essentially is you know branches, and shoot of loblolly pine seedlings and then they show they talk about the composition of different chemical compounds within those different parts of the seedlings in terms of nitrogen containing compounds like amino acids proteins and nucleic acids carbohydrates like sucrose cellulose hemicellulose lipids or fats lignin organic acids and phenolics in those different parts of the plants. And then they show for those different categories of compounds, how much glucose is expended to produce those different classes of compounds. So essentially what that means is how much glucose is metabolized by respiration to produce the ATP and carbon skeletons, I spelled that wrong, <laughs> carbon skeletons, necessary to produce 
those different compounds. So you can see, for instance, it requires 1.579 grams of glucose to produce one gram of nitrogenous compounds. Um, it takes almost a little bit more than three grams of glucose to produce one gram of lipids. So we sometimes think about lipids, fat, fats, for instance, as having as being a high energy compound. That's because it takes a lot of energy to produce those. So that's the um, carbon cost associated with the respiration to produce carbon skeletons and ATP to produce those compounds. And then they said, okay, here's how much glucose, given the composition and the cost of those different components, here's how much glucose it takes to produce a gram of needles, for instance. All of that together is essentially the growth respiration associated with producing a gram of needles, a gram of axis, and a gram of shoot. So this is the painstaking calculation of the res growth respiration cost of producing a gram of needles, axis, or shoot, of this case, uh, La Bolle Pine seedling biomass. This, this is a different way of looking at it. Here they're showing the construction costs, and that's in gram of glucose per gram of biomass. So that's just the um, amount of glucose that has to be respired to produce ATP, the energy, and the carbon skeletons to produce a gram of leaf, stem, root, or seed for a range of different plant types. This is a review uh, article that, written by Porter. This is uh, in the Lambers et al. textbook. What you can see is that there's different uh, carbon cost or respirate, construction respiration cost associated with root, stem, leaf, or seeds. And if you think about it a little bit, you can see why, for instance, a leaf might cost more to construct than a root. A leaf has a lot more living cells in it, a lot more proteins in it than, for instance, root tissue, which is essentially mostly xylem tissue, which is mostly dead when functional. Um, so a leaf tissue will cost more to construct. Seeds and fruit, um, a wide range, but in general, have a higher construction cost because, for instance, they have a lot more lipids in them, but also a lot more protein. So their construction cost will be, in general, higher than all the other tissues. So another nice illustration of the growth respiration cost of a number of different types of tissue. This is a nice example from the literature which illustrates the use of different components of respiration to understand patterns of energy production and use by trees. This is uh, an example from Hinoki cypress, which is an, an important tree culturally and commercially in Japan. In this case, they were just looking at growth and maintenance respiration. They did this analysis by enclosing an, individual, an entire Hinoki cypress tree in a chamber and measuring gas exchange. And they essentially um, measured respiration using that chamber and used some techniques. You should read the paper if you want to see how they separated growth and maintenance respiration. But basically use those calculations to, on a monthly basis, calculate, calculate um, the amount of respiration in grams of CO2 per day associated with growth respiration and maintenance respiration. So what you can see is that, for instance, in April of 1986, there were the tree on average respired about, you know, about four grams of CO2 per day 
associated with growth respiration. That's this part. And then the difference between those two right here. So that's what? About 9 minus 4, so about 5 grams of CO2 per day in maintenance respiration. So these filled, the filled areas of this curve represents growth respiration. And then the area between that growth respiration and this upper line represents maintenance respiration. So there's a couple of things we can see from these data and this categorization. First, we can see that growth respiration is essentially zero during the winter. Okay, so during this period, growth respiration is zero. That's because the at least the above ground parts of the tree are not growing during the temperate dormant season. And growth respiration peaks, you know, for instance, in June and July during the period of most rapid growth of the tree. So that's not necessarily surprising. Another thing we can see is that maintenance respiration is never zero. So you can see maintenance respiration is occurring even during the dormant season. Okay, that's because there's still living cells in the above ground part of the tree that need to be maintained even during the dormant season. Uh, another thing we see is that the amount of maintenance respiration increases from year to year. So over time, the basically CO2 spent on maintenance res respiration increases from year to year. Why might that be? Well, that's because there's more tissue, the tree is growing larger. There's more tissue to be maintained and therefore the maintenance respiration cost increases over time. We also see the pattern of variation in maintenance respiration cost throughout the year, where it's largest in the summer and smallest in the winter. Well, that's not just due to the amount of tissue there. That's also due to the fact that maintenance respiration is uh, uh, varies with temperature. And we'll talk about that in a subsequent part of the lecture. So maintenance respiration varies both within the year and between years, both due to the amount of tissue that's being uh, maintained, but also due to the environment. So this is a nice example of how breaking up respiration into maintenance and growth can help us to understand uh, how the energy from respiration is being used uh, over time by, in this case, an entire tree. I think that's a really helpful breakup. Now, they didn't uh, break out um, transport respiration, but there are papers that also break out transport transport respiration so we can see how that energy is used as well.